One of our residents, Dr. Bala, who has been working on this uh, since uh, prior to her residency, she's going to talk about the genetic correlations as well as multifocal um, ERG correlations uh, for uh, macular de early macular degeneration. Hello, everybody. I'm Elisa Bala. I'm a um, PGY3 case resident. And today I'm going to talk on multifocal electroretinography and genetic correlations in early age related macular degeneration. Um, these are the keywords that you're going to hear me um, mention quite a bit. And a little background, um, age-related macular degeneration, as we know, is a uh, disease of the elderly. It's a late-onset progressive degeneration of photoreceptor and uh, RPE in the macula. And unfortunately, it results in uh, progressive and irreversible loss of vision. It is a major cause of uncorrectable uh, visual impairment in the elderly population. And according to 2007 data, there was 1.7 million people affected in the US only. And this number is uh, expected to rise. Um, clinically, macular degeneration is divided into early and a late onset. Early characterized by drusen and pigmentary changes and late onset um, either dry or wet, wet being the most devastating form and um, geographic atrophy being actually the most common form. Um, several grading systems uh, have been developed including ARETS and the uh, CARMS. Um, our study, as you're gonna see, is gonna be based on the uh, grading from ARETS. Several risk factors have been studied in age-related macular degeneration, including age, race, smoking, light exposure, a little controversial, um, higher BMI, hypertension, cataract surgery, and genetic predisposition. Genetic correlations, um, it's been quite a, quite a bit of research on genetics, on macular degeneration, and um, many genes are involved. Initially, it was studied in the 80s as case uh, control association studies, and currently, most commonly, are done uh, candidate gene analysis and genome-wide association studies. Um, the genes that have been studied are involved in several pathophysiological pathways, including the inflammatory and immune system, extracellular matrix, um, detoxification pathways involving the apoprotein E, and um, other elements. Multifocal electroretinography is a relatively new, I would say, um, way of assessing the um, uh, retina electrophysiological activity. It provides a topographic map of um, this activity by measuring individual local ERG responses. It is a cone ERG because it is derived from the cones and um, it is recorded under light adapted conditions. Um, the stimulus um, matrix um, is comprised of hexagonal patterns, it's many of them, and they flicker according to a pseudorandom sequence. Um, then the recorded waveforms are actually not real waveforms, like in standard ERGs, they are uh, computational um, uh, mathematical extractions from the real waveforms. And um, here I do have, this is how the system looks like. It's fairly simple. This is the stimulator and this is the screen. And this is a Burian Allen contact lens electrode that is uh, well preferably used for using for recording multifocal ERGs. And um, here I have for you presented this is a stimulus matrix um, and this individual little hexagons here they flicker according to that sequence. This represents the 103 um, little hexagons. This is the most commonly used and um, actually also uh, mentioned as a standard ERG on the recent guidelines. And from um, stimulating individual areas of the retina, the recorded waveforms are right here. So each little hexagon stimulates this portion of the retina in the posterior pole in the uh, central 50 degrees of the posterior pole and this is what you get. You get a little waveform. Now this is called a trace array. However, when you do the uh, analysis and trying to uh, figure out your, your study question, um, then you go and you group this individual waveform responses in however it fits your study question. 
Most commonly, it's used the, the concentric ring averages, and especially for macular degeneration, it actually um, goes along with the, the, the pathophysiology and what happens in that disease. Now, um, as I said, if you group these little individual waveforms, you come up with six rings here, six, uh, six ring averages here. And um, on this waveform, you don't use an A or B wave that were used in the standard TRG. You actually go with uh, the first negative peak, first positive peak, and then you go with their amplitude and the uh, latency. Now back to our research question. Um, this is what we want to find out. Is there any relationship? Is there any correlation between known genetic factors for AMD and um, these um, MFERG responses? Our study population is a subset of a much larger cohort of veterans that um, are included in genetic and proteomic studies previously studied and uh, um, reported also by laboratories of Kola Institute of Dr. Stephanie Hagstrom, John Crabb, and Neil Pichy. Um, in this particular study that I'm presenting today, um, there were only um, 28 patients involved and 34 unrelated age-matched controls. They're all elderly male, uh, elderly veterans, mean age 71. Um, all subjects underwent complete ophthalmologic examination, including best corrected vision and dilated exams. Um, as I said before, the ARIDS uh, grading system was used to subcategorize the patients. And included in this study um, are only category two patients, 23 of the 28, and um, category three, five of the 28. So it's basically mild and moderate AMD. Controls, of course, lacked macular drusen and uh, had no other retinal disorder. Subjects uh, consented to a blood sample and electrophysiology testing. Um, the genetic screening, uh, we used direct genomic sequences, uh, sequencing and, um, and or RFLP. Um, there were many genes studied actually by the lab, uh, laboratory of Dr. Stephanie Hagstrom. However, in uh, this particular study, we decided to um, see what's the relationship between the four, let's say most important uh, genes or at least that have been shown to um, occur most commonly in people with age-related macular degeneration. And these are the complement factor H, the complement component 3, and two other genes that happen to be on the same chromosome very close to each other, uh, the ARMS2 and the HTRA. And I also put here what each of them, at least we think, does. Uh, now, multifocal ERG recordings, um, as I said before, the 103 hexagon stimulus array is used because that's a standard one, and the central 50 degrees of posterior pole. Continuous monitoring of fixation was done during the whole recording time with either the eye or the fundus camera. Burian Allen electrode was used, and the Verisign software by EDI version 5.8 was used. Um, the recorded data were analyzed in concentric ring averages and the amplitudes and latency were uh, noted. Sigma plot and Kalita graph versions were used for the statistical analysis and generation of the graphs. Um, coming to our results, I just put this one here, um, what the results will be, I'll go over the, the graphs with you. So two things, the sum of the risk alleles. So for each of the four genes, there are two alleles and we looked at how much uh, or what is the correlation actually? What is the correlation? How much of the correlation it is between the number of the risk alleles and um, the either delay in response in, in latency or decrease in amplitude? And we actually found that there is delay with the higher number of risk alleles that an individual has, there will be more delay in the latency of the peak response more pronounced in the ring one and two and three, which are the central and the paracentral ones. Um, there was no such relationship found for the amplitude or the more peripheral areas. When individual risk alleles were, um, were studied, um, the important ones, the ones that actually show statistical significance in our small sample size were the ARMS and the HTRA. 
And um, there we go. So these are graphs, these are plots actually, scatter plots that show the correlation between the sum of risk alleles ranging from zero in control, no, from zero in patients here to eight. I, unfortunately, I didn't have anybody who was um, homozygote for all four of risk alleles. Um, and this represent, this data plots here represent the um, difference, the, the latency difference from the controls mean. As is seen on the graphs, there is a correlation. It is a weak correlation in rings one and three, but it is there in our data. And there is not such a thing for either the amplitudes or the rings uh, five to six, four to six. And this is the individual genes assessed with um, each risk allele um, mentioned here. And as I said, again, for the latency, for the ARMS, and HTRA, there is this positive uh, correlation that is still seen here. So in conclusion, yes, there is a correlation. This is what we were able to find. Is it strong? Well, we have a very small um, sample size. We see something. Can we say it is determined that there is this correlation and it's worth going after? We can say it now. So, Larger study will be needed to fully characterize this, uh, this genotype-phenotype correlation with the emphasis on early detection and monitoring of the disease. However, the fact that we found this, uh, the ARMS and the HTRA genes, the ones that are actually located close to each other on the same chromosome being um, also uh, the most important ones, in the correlation we're showing here compared to C3 and CFH, that actually suggests that different genes have different pathophysiological signature in their um, way of acting. And this is it, thank you.